Okay, let's get started. This first practice of our cube from 1997. A particle moves along the x-axis so that the velocity at time t greater than zero is given by this dude. The position uh, x of t is 5 for t equals 2. This is all decoding right here. Some of you guys should... Um, now, now look at this. Oops. Go back. Okay, hold on. Uh, I want you guys to look at the, the v, the velocity function, like it's f prime. All right, uh, here, let me, let me write down some stuff right here. If you guys have um, velocity, that is the same idea as f prime. I don't know, I, this always helped me, like just relating them to each other. Uh, this is uh, your slope function. Okay, so if I went backwards, if I took the antiderivative of that and I got f, that would be your position function. Now in this case, they didn't use p of t as a position function, they used x of t. Probably because it's talking about the particle moving along the x-axis. So this is your position function. Position is like your normal, like your function before you take derivatives of it. So if I had uh, f double prime, what would that be? That would be acceleration, and they normally write it with an a. So this would be your acceleration of the particle. Yeah, so look at the first one. It says, write the polynomial expression for the position of the particle. That is this guy. It wants you to find f. We have f prime. That is the velocity. So we're going to find f, or x of t, by taking the antiderivative. So that's what you do for the first one. The first one you take, um, let's see, for a, we're going to take, well, I mean, we could do this in our head, but 3t squared minus 2t uh, minus 1, and we're going to do the antiderivative of that. So we have, um, we add 1 to the 2, which would make it 3, so it's t to the 3rd, and there's a 3 in front, and then we have to divide it by whatever we get. So we're dividing it by 3. The next one, uh, we would get 2t to the 2nd, because we added 1 to the power right here, and then we have to divide it by that 2. And then the last one, we would get uh, minus uh, t. Because this would technically be t to the 0 power, and you have to add 1 to it, so we have t to the 1 power, but we normally don't write the 1. And then if you divide by 1, you still get the same thing, so we don't normally write that either. So this um, is almost finished. Don't forget. Thank you. Your C. You guys are getting so anxious. So this is going to be x of t. Now, um, how do we find that C? We need to have that. We need to have the C. Yeah, this guy right here. They gave us a point. It says the position x of t is 5 at 2. So the t equals 2, and the y value, which is x of t, is 5. So it gave us a point right there. It is um, 2, 5. We're going to use that point to find the c. Because see, right now we have this variable, which is the y value, and we have the t's, and we have a c. So we have three variables total. We can't find the c unless we have a value for the t's and the x of t. And so we have that. So let's um, go ahead and plug that in. We're going to have 5 right here equals, uh, oh, this stuff can be simplified. That's gone, that's gone, those equal 1. So we have, um, what is that, 2? Two, 2 raised to the second, or third power minus uh, 2 raised to the second power, and then minus 2, and we have plus C. So we're looking for C, just got to get the C alone. So this is going to be 8, this is going to be 4. 8 minus 4 is going to be 4, minus a 2 is going to be 2. So we have 5, 2, minus, is that minus C or plus C? Plus C. Then uh, we get C equals 3. So my answer here is X of T equals, uh, simplified as T to the third power minus T squared minus T plus 3. Those are T's, not pluses. Okay, so this is the answer for the first part. Uh, next part says, um, for what values of t in this interval is the particle's instantaneous velocity the same as its average velocity? Average velocity on the closed interval. Okay, so how would you find your average velocity? This, guys, is related to, you guys, uh, I don't know if you guys ever heard of this, mean value theorem? Yeah. This is, yeah, we're going to see this in the next two F or Qs that we're looking at. Now, mean value theorem, let me, hold on, hold on your question, please. Uh, 
what you're doing is you're finding the slope of the secant line, and then you're finding um, where the slope equals that. Okay, so here, let me give you guys a, a, a visual. If you guys had a function, let's say this is your function right like this, your secant line, like between A and B, oops, that's your secant line. The average velocity, <coughs> or I, I should say the average slope, remember slope is the same as velocity, the average slope between A and B is going to be the slope of the secant line. So you just have to find the slope between these two points. That's it. That is the same as the average velocity. We can change that. Instead of it saying average velocity, we can say the average rate of change. Velocity is the same as rate of change. Velocity is the same as slope. It's kind of annoying, isn't it? They use all these different words to mean the same thing. Do we do that in our English language? Yeah. Yeah, we do. That's annoying too. All right. So, how would we find the slope of this secant line? Now, I don't. This curve isn't correct. I don't think so. But um, it gives us a, a a good visual. Now, our a and our b is zero and three. So it's over this interval. So what am I going to use to find the y values? I have I have a zero. And I have a three. What am I going to use to find the y values? Am I going to use the velocity function? No. Or am I going to use the position function? Position function. This curve right here is the position. Uh, average rate of change, um, that's, we would not be finding um, the average rate of change if we use this one. You'd find the average, average rate of change of the change. That's kind of weird. All right, so let's plug in zero. Yeah, acceleration. Um, if I plug in zero to this, I'm going to get three. You know, all those t's just go to zero. That's beautiful. If I plug in three to these, uh, that's going to be 27 minus 9, which is 18, right? Yeah. And then we have to subtract 3 from that, which is 15, but then I add 3, which is back to 18. So we have 0, 3, and 3, 18. If I find the slope of that, it's going to be 15 up top, because I go 18 minus 3. And the bottom, I'm going to go 3 minus 0. Remember, you have to go in the same order. So we have 5. This is your average uh, velocity, or the average rate of change. Average velocity is the same thing. So you want to find, so remember, let's go back to what it says. For what values of t between these two is the particle's instantaneous velocity the same as, as its average velocity? So what you're looking for, guys, is the c. You don't know where the c is. Okay, so right here, it kind of looks like that's where it would be. You want to see where you get this parallel tangent line to the secant line. So we're going to take the 5, and we're going to set that equal to the velocity function, our slope function. So we're going to have 5 equals 3t squared minus 2t minus 1. All right, if you bust out your algebra skills, you know that it has to equal 0. So you can have 0 equals 3t squared minus 2t uh, minus 6. Try to factor it. If you can't factor it, use the quadratic formula. Now, I'm pretty lazy when it comes to stuff like this. I don't want to try to factor this. I'm just going to throw everything into the quadratic formula to get my, my solution. Uh, now, if you're not allowed to use a calculator on this, then you would leave your answer in radical form if it comes out radical form. If you are allowed to use a calculator, then you want to put it in decimal form. You're going to do like the third decimal, unless it specifies what to round it to. And this one doesn't specify what to round it to. So I'm not sure yet if this would be like in a calculator section or a non-calculator section. If you plug all this into your quadratic formula, you're going to get x equals 1 plus or minus square root of 19 divided by what? What is it divided by? 3. Three? Okay. So you're going to get two answers. One of them is going to make sense. It has to be a positive t. So it's not going to be the negative one. It's going to be the positive one. And so that's going to be approximately equal to, what was it? 6 point? 1.786. Okay. So that's what you would write for your answer. That's the value of t that equals the average velocity on this interval. Okay, last one says, find the total distance traveled by the particle time uh, from 0 to 3. So here, this is how I'm going to attempt to explain it. If I had, um, if I had a graph right here, uh, and I had like different speeds going on, like this is 25 miles per hour, and this is 50 miles per hour. Okay, um, how would I find out how far I went? 
we'll call this t and this equals hours and this would be one hour and this would be two hours so well, this question would actually be a little more simple if we if I wouldn't draw a graph I mean it wouldn't sound as confusing uh, but it's kind of common sense after one hour of driving uh, we were traveling 25 miles per hour so we that means we went uh, 25 total miles then we would add the next hour which is this interval right here where we were going 50 miles per hour so that's a total of 50 uh, miles so the total distance you would have traveled from you know zero seconds to two seconds would be 75 um, so really what we're doing is we're just finding the area underneath this curve which is known as the integral the area of this rectangle to find the area of that we just multiply the base which is 1 times 25 so 1 times 25 and this one right here would also be 1 and that would be times 50 that's how we get 25 and 50 um, but I have some like a weird uh, weird scenario to present what if um, for the next hour your car broke down and you had to drive backwards that would be a negative speed we'll say that's a negative 5 and you did that for an hour so now we have an area underneath the curve that is under the x-axis, which means this is actually a negative area. So for another hour, we drive negative 5 miles per hour, so we would go uh, a distance of negative 5, but backwards. So really, from start to finish, you didn't travel a total of 75 anymore. You traveled a total of, I mean, like, from where you started you would only be 70 miles away from where you started they call it displacement uh, this is displacement so like if you started at A and you went to B but then you drove backwards for a little bit you're now at C at 70 miles from the beginning they call it displacement but if you're talking about total distance actually traveling you didn't really only travel 70 you traveled from A to B. You traveled this. No, my B doesn't look like a B. You traveled this distance, and then you traveled this distance back to C. So you traveled this distance plus this distance. So instead of having just a negative five right there, we have a positive five. So we can find out the total distance we actually traveled. So it would say uh, twenty-five plus 50 plus negative 5. And we have to do the absolute value of that. So this is kind of weird. Uh, and you're probably wondering, why are you talking about all this? Because of how we're going to have to set up our problem. All right, so now let me come back to our problem and explain what we're doing. Now, if we think about our goofy little curve right here, it's not really a curve, but, you know, this line, this line, and this line, that is a function of velocity, right? We were talking about velocity or speeds. That's what these are, speeds. Well, our function of velocity for this problem that we're working with is 3t squared minus 2t minus 1. So the while well, this one up here, to find the area underneath that curve, we would go from 0 to 3v squared, I'm sorry, v of t dt. This would give us the total area underneath it. Um, it would actually uh, give us the 70, you know, the first one that we found out. But we don't want to subtract the 5. We want to count the 5 towards total distance traveled. So what we do is we take the absolute value of the function. So what we're going to need to know is where does this function go positive or where does it go negative? Where does it switch um, or does it switch its sign? If we were to graph this, we get something like this. I got this off of decimals. You can see from 0 to 3, uh, which is actually, oh, it's off my graph. It's over here. That's a 2 right there. At 1, that's when the sign changes. Uh, first it's negative, and then at 1 it becomes positive. So how would we see that without, without the picture? Well, we would have to factor it and set it equal to 0. When we factor this, we get 3t uh, plus 1 uh, and t minus 1 and we set that equal to 0. We're looking for that x-intercept that 1 uh, and so you would get you get two values for t. You would get t equals negative 1 over 3 and you get positive 1. So those are the x-intercepts for this function. That's at these values right here I guess they're critical points because that's technically f prime. 
uh, that's where the sine changes. So because the sine changes at 1, we have to split up our integral for the velocity at, at 1. Uh, we don't care about this one because this is not in our interval. Our interval is from 0 to 3. So we, need, uh, we have one interval from uh, 0 to 1, and we have to find that um, integral of 3t squared minus 2t um, minus 1 dt. And then we also have to add the integral from 1 to 3, which is, uh, what is that? Um, 3t squared minus 2t minus 1 dt. Now, if we didn't look at our graph, we would know that one of these is going to be a negative area because, because it drops below the x-axis. Uh, now, since we looked at a graph, we know that this one's supposed to be negative. But let's go ahead and do it. We would do the antiderivative of this, uh, plug in our 0 and a 1, and then we do the antiderivative of this, we're going to plug in the 1 and the, and the 3. Now, we know the antiderivative of this to be this because we already did it. So we have t to the third power minus t squared minus t plus 3. And we're going to go from 1 to 3 on that one. Oops, I wrote that in the wrong spot. And it's from 0 to 1, not 1 to 3. And then I'm going to add same thing but different interval. So we have 3 minus t squared minus t plus 3 from 1 to 3. And that one looks weird in that spot. Okay, so um, <clears throat> let's plug that stuff in. When I plug in the 1, I'm going to get, see that's going to be uh, 1 minus 1, which is 0, minus 1 would be negative 1, plus 3 would be 2, and I'm going to subtract after I plug in 0, so that's going to be 3, and I get negative 1 right here, and then I'm going to add that to whatever I get when I plug in 3. When I plug in 3, I'm going to get 18. When I plug in 1, just like we did over there, and I'm going to get 2, so I'm going to subtract 2 from that. That's going to be uh, 16. So I have negative 1 and 16. There's the negative, just like up here with the negative. Now remember what we did with that is we took the absolute value of that and then added it to uh, we took the absolute value of that and then added it to the, the, seven, the 75 to get 80. So this would be uh, 17. So the total different distance traveled, which is what it asked, the total distance traveled, not its displacement, uh, is 17.